Hello, and welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel. And this week, I want to talk about a groundbreaking new study on metabolism, specifically what does and doesn't happen to our metabolisms during middle age. Most of us reach our final adult height at around age 18 or 20. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that we stop growing. On average, Americans continue to gain a pound or two a year every year from the time that they reach adulthood until age 60 or so when this trend starts to reverse. Of course, by then, a lot of damage has been done. Although gaining a single pound or two over the course of a year isn't going to make a big difference in your health, gaining 30 or 40 pounds over the course of your adult lifespan can have a significant negative impact on your risk of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and other conditions related to obesity, such as knee pain and sleep apnea. So what drives this weight gain in middle age? There's long been an assumption that this seemingly universal trend is due, at least in part, to a slowing of the metabolism in midlife. We've all been told that our body's engines simply rev a little faster when we're younger and that there's not that much that can be done. If we want to avoid gaining weight through midlife, we're going to have to spend more time exercising or adjust our food intake to compensate for this inevitable slowing of the metabolism. Now, If you refuse to go gently into this good night, you can find all kinds of special diets, workouts, and supplements promising to goose up your middle-aged metabolism. To the extent that any of these actually succeed in boosting your resting metabolic rate, the effect is likely to be quite small. As I've said before, trying to lose weight by boosting your metabolism is like trying to row a boat with a butter knife. You're going to be rowing for an awfully long time without moving very far. But a new study is throwing all of these assumptions about midlife metabolism into the blender. Researchers used a sophisticated technique called the doubly labeled water method to measure energy expenditure in a diverse population of over 6,000 people. And these subjects ranged in age from newborn to 95 years old. And they also came from a wide variety of ethnic backgrounds and cultures. And the results were almost exactly the opposite of what our observations might have led us to believe. Not surprisingly, our metabolic rate is highest when we are babies. It peaks at about 12 months of age, and it then declines steadily until we reach early adulthood. But then our metabolic rate is remarkably stable from age 20 to age 60. There is virtually no slowing in midlife. The next change doesn't seem to occur until around age 60, when the metabolism does indeed start to slow down. But remember, this is the same age when people typically stop gaining weight and start gradually losing weight. It's basically the exact opposite of what you'd expect to see if you assume that age-related changes in body weight are driven largely by age-related changes in our metabolic rate. To the contrary, this study shows that all other things being equal, our metabolisms are actually no slower in our 40s and 50s than they were in our 20s and 30s. So why do so many of us gain weight and or struggle to lose it as we go through midlife? Well, clearly, all other things are not equal. So if it's not our metabolism, then what is it? We may simply be taking in more calories than we need. There are certainly plenty of opportunities to do that. And I talked about some of them in my previous episode, Why We Overeat. Perhaps we are also moving less. Even if we're making time for regular exercise, the rest of our day may be a lot more sedentary at age 40 than when we were younger. Think, for example, about how you tend to spend time with your friends now compared with how you might have when you were younger. Are your leisure activities more or less active than they used to be? Perhaps we're just mirroring what has been modeled for us in terms of how grown-ups, quote-unquote, behave. Or we may move less because our bodies are getting stiff or achy, but unfortunately, inactivity simply accelerates that process. When we move and use our bodies less, our body composition also changes. 
we lose muscle mass, which further reduces both our capacity to move and the number of calories we burn at rest. So in that sense, our metabolism may in fact be slowing down, but not due to our age. Rather, it's slowing as a result of lifestyle choices that we may be more likely to make as we age. In fact, this study confirms that the amount of fat-free mass that you have is the single most significant factor in how much energy you expend, even more significant than how many calories you burn through exercise and much more significant than your age. So the good news here is that much more of this may be within our control than we previously assumed, but we may need to stop acting our age, or better put, stop following our society's script for what middle age looks like. My colleague, Dr. Jonathan Sue, who recently stepped into Brock Armstrong's shoes as the new host of the Get Fit Guy podcast, has lots of good advice for people of all ages and fitness levels on being more active, no matter what limitations you may be working with. Just this week, for example, after listening to his show, I realized that I could be getting a lot more benefit from my morning walks by picking up my pace. So thanks for that, Dr. Sue. From a nutrition perspective, Protein can be a key player in our quest to beat the midlife spread. Including the right amount of high-quality protein in our diets can help us maintain both our weight and our body composition, and it does this in at least three important ways. Number one, protein helps to temper the appetite, and that can make it a lot easier to curb that tendency to overeat. Number two, Protein also has a direct effect on metabolism through the greater thermic effect of food. And what that means is that you burn more calories after eating protein than you do after eating the equivalent amount of calories from fats or carbohydrates. The effect is small, but hey, every little bit helps. And number three, protein in conjunction with exercise and movement helps us build and maintain muscle tissue. And that helps us burn more calories at rest. To that end, I suggest including some sort of protein food in most of your meals and snacks. Now, animal foods, and that includes eggs, fish, and dairy, provide the most bioavailable and concentrated sources of protein. Beans, legumes, grains, nuts, and seeds also provide protein. Just be aware that it takes more servings of plant-based foods to provide the same amount of protein as you'd get from fewer servings of most animal-based foods. My previous episode on protein density can help you manage your protein intake while also keeping an eye on your total calorie intake, and that can be particularly important for people who do get their protein from plant-based sources. You may also want to check out my episodes on preventing age-related muscle loss and building more muscle from less protein. I also have a post on building muscle on plant-based diets. You'll find links to all of those, as well as to the study that I talked about today in the show notes for today's episode. And show notes are, as always, at quickanddirtytips.com. And finally, Brock Armstrong and I recently teamed up to create a special pop-up podcast series specifically on beating midlife spread. It's free, and you can subscribe to it at wayless.life slash midlife. That's wayless.life slash midlife. The Nutrition Diva Show is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Nathan Sams with script editing by Adam Cecil. Our operations and editorial manager is Michelle Margulis. Our assistant manager is Emily Miller. And our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin. You can follow The Nutrition Diva on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a question that you'd like me to answer, you can email me at nutrition at quickanddirtytips.com. Or you can leave me a message on the Nutrition Diva listener line. That's at 443-961-6206. And when you do, just be sure to tell me if it's okay to use your voice on the show. That's all for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week. Bye.